So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this Wednesday evening, almost actually Thursday. It's uh, close to midnight here where I'm at. And I've just been up and doing some research regarding uh, the UN General Assembly that's currently taking place in New York and specifically uh, Mr. Zelensky's speech. Um, I'm very interested in world affairs. I actually got started with the model United Nations back in high school and competed on various debates and assessments um, when I was younger. I've always been a fan of learning about countries, situations, market conditions, ways to help and improve, you know, relationships and the overall situation in various countries worldwide. My parents are immigrants, so naturally sparked an interest in me to learn about the world and how to best contribute to the betterment of societies worldwide. Yes, I did grow up in America, and even in America, we have been, you know, um, taught to be considerate and, and respect each other, regardless of, you know, the difference in opinion, you know, background, worldview, whatever. So I would think that maybe that's a concept that perhaps you know, some of the world community and members of the world community will consider implementing in their own cultural dyna cultural dynamics. I'm not saying America's perfect by any means. Um, I certainly will not, you know, toot my own horn in saying that we're perfect as a country. We are trying our best to do things right. And we're still, you know, a long ways to becoming the country that we ought to be depending on who you ask and who's in charge, I guess. But anyway, uh, going back to uh, Mr. Zelensky's speech, I apologize, I'm a little tired. I had to listen to his speech a few times and do the research regarding his uh, previous position at the NATO summit in Lithuania that took place last July 11th to the 12th. And just, you know, try to piece together everything that he said. It took me a couple of hours to get this all organized. So I'm a little tired. I apologize if I, I seem to drag a little. But uh, just try to hear me out and, and let me know if there's anything that I miss or misinterpreted, at least. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm, I'm a little tired, but I'm going to do my best to connect the dots here. So, let's start off at, you know, um, what took place last year, February of last year. Um, there was indeed an occupation, according to my research, there was an occupation that took place uh, in both territories, in a Ukrainian territory and a Russian territory which was basically uh, annexed by the Russian Donbass. Um, let me give you guys, a, you know, a, a full, you know, uh, transparency, you know, uh, initiative that I would like to endorse. I'm not taking sides. Um, you know, I sympathize to a lot of the people that have been affected by the war due to the decisions of their decision makers in their countries. So I'm not trying to take sides, I'm just trying to evaluate exactly what's being said. Uh, I've always done this uh, ever since when I was in college and even, you know, all the way back in high school. I'd like to 
kind of learn and, and research some of the situation and the pre-existing conditions in various countries around the world. So I guess that what that's what led me to become a um, you know market entry international business consultant. But with that said, so there were a lot of things that was you know touch up on by Mr. Solinsky. So uh, um, I, I'm not really sure how to start off with it, but. He, he was pretty much going all over the place. So, um, yeah, so let's try this. Um, there was a semi-invasion in Ukraine. Um, according to what I've managed to uncover, uh, the Russians didn't manage to uh, convert Ukraine into a full-pledged territorial occupation, which is a whole country occupied by a foreign force. Um, they never really occupied Kiev or made it all the way to the western border. So it tells me that maybe there was no interest in the whole of Ukraine. Um, and so at least that's my assessment. Please let me know if I'm incorrect or have overlooked something. But based on my research, I, I was reading some news online and tried to look at also some of the maps uh, where there's an ongoing war. It doesn't look like Ukraine had been occupied as a whole country. And obviously there's, you know, the uh, oppo opposing sides, the Ukrainians that are preventing them from, you know, marching into Kiev and other parts of the western section of, of Ukraine. But I guess if the Russians wanted to occupy the whole country, they would have had the opportunity to do that on numerous occasions. And, you know, given that they had more weapons than the Ukrainian initially had, uh, the Ukrainians had, had uh, last year. So that's just something that I thought it was kind of interesting to kind of reflect on, you know, because they never made it to, you know, the, near the borders of, of Poland, Slovenia, I mean, the Russians, or even, you know, borders on their south neighboring countries. So, I mean, maybe I didn't find enough information at least. Um, with that said, I'm going to continue to uh, videotape this blog or video blog and podcast, but just in case if we were to get disconnected on our video blog, I'm going to link the full podcast link at the bottom section of this video blog on our YouTube channel. So you all can, you know, keep on listening. You know, I might excuse me, I might slow down a little just because there's a lot of information that I ended up acquiring, but this is all uh, basically to just, you know, put together this really strange puzzle uh, that's been ongoing for almost two years. It's not quite two years, but it's getting there, uh, depending on, you know, if the decision makers in both Ukraine and Russia could find a way to resolve this conflict uh, before February of next year. So there was a NATO summit, right, last July, and that was in effect to um, basically influence NATO members on allowing um, Ukraine to join the PAC, the group, the club, you know, the good old boys club, I guess is what they would call it back in the States. So, um, yeah, and unfortunately, um, uh, Ukraine was given the basic political, bureaucratic, and diplomatic verbiage which, you know, they have to meet a certain condition prior to joining 
NAO, or maybe a few more conditions. I don't know. I mean, that tends to be the case in most of these international pacts and you know treaties and session mechanism. Um, you know, similar to the Bretton Woods Pact, your grain round, you name it. There's always a you know <laughs> a caveat to the clauses on these types of agreements. So one of that is that they weren't allowed to join NATO while there is an ongoing war in Ukraine. So obviously they basically would have to wait until the war ends. Somebody, you know, decides to give up or somebody decides to, you know, completely you know, get, just not continue with the war altogether. So the Ukrainian, Mr. Zelensky, had tweeted that because of that kind of, I guess he saw it as a reprimand, that kind of uh, ambiguity, uh, he tweeted that it creates weakness and uncertainty uh, for NATO's overall, you know, uh, persona, how the world would see NATO. So I'm curious to know um, why were they banking so much on NATO to begin with? Um, I don't think um, there will be any form of aggression towards, you know, NATO member countries from the Russians. At least there aren't any indicators that the Russians wants to go to war with any NATO countries. Um, and and I, again, I've, I've been doing some research online i'm not trying to take sides i'm just trying to assess what's really going on based on the available information uh that news sources in europe as well as the u.s are sharing with the world so again i i don't see any you know reason for russia to consider attacking NATO member countries. Um, he also talked about, you know, um, in his UN address. Um, well, actually, before I, I continue with his UN address, I, I think I'll just finish off with this NATO issue. So basically, uh, one of his analysts, uh, Mr. Zelensky's advisor, said that Russia understands the language of force. And, okay, uh, may, that may be the case. But they also said that NATO sends out the signal of hesitation, the language of hesitation. Not sure what that really means because NATO is not engaged on a war with Russia. So, and I don't think NATO even wants to, you know, get into conflict with Russia. So that's something that wasn't really clear to me. And again, please help me out if I'm not putting this all together properly. Um, not taking sides, I just want to make sure that um, analyzing the condition and situation as you know, people that are engaged in this war are you know putting or sharing it with the world. Um, so let's move on to his address at the UN General conference um, you know he, he touched up on third world war which really um, I don't see this being a full-fledged war even not even in Europe I, I don't even see this becoming 
a war that would manifest into, you know, a, a global conflict. It's more of a regional misunderstanding to me. Um, and I don't know if, you know, the caliber of the analysts that are present at the United Nations, because most countries send their analysts, ambassadors, representatives um, to those events, uh, you know, the General Assembly. Back in the day when I was in high school or even in college, some of the analysts uh, are pretty, you know, uh, they're pretty sharp. You know, they know how to read between the lines and they tend to request, you know, some sort of clarity if something isn't clear to them. Okay, because that's what the UN does and they try to figure out what is being said and what could happen and how it's going to affect their countries. Um, and to me, you know, and I'm being honest, there wasn't a whole lot of clarity on some of the points and the talking points that were shared um, by Mr. Zelensky, fortunately. You know, he talked about, you know, nuclear stockpiles and weaponizing, you know, the food uh, situation. And, you know, he said that, you know, some of their agriculture products are being blocked uh, by the Russians on the Danube River and it's affecting the global markets you know I, I maybe some buyers are affected i mean i'm in the international trade and commerce industry yes i've seen the news on some of the markets maybe buying countries affected but not to the point that they're going to go hungry because they can't get access to grains from Ukraine. There's other countries that export grains, wheat products. Yes, I, I do agree that Ukraine is one of the biggest country producing wheat products, grains. But I, I don't think that, you know, people would pick up on arms and march to Ukraine because they're lacking that food material in their market. Pricing, he mentioned that pricing is also weaponized. Perhaps the more demand and lack of supply could affect pricing. But again, I, I don't see that being that big of an issue for people importing grains that 